let's start my talk is in six parts part one is a small introduction after that i will spend some time talking about the anthropocene the third part will actually be on evidence that the anthropocene is here part 4 will be on what i have called deep time and during this section we will look at how inglit or english literature the institution of literature and literary studies has reacted to uh, the anthropocene or the coming of the anthropocene in my fifth section i will look at kerala and the anthropocene because we need to make it relevant to ourselves and then at the end i will introduce a few books that will be the sixth part if you are still alive then i will mention three or four books and actually tell you something about the contents of those books all right that's my plan so let me move on from that to the introduction uh, the first thing i want to tell you about this talk is that i am not a scientist and i do not understand science so my perspective is that of a layman all right a layman who reads a little bit and therefore has been interested in things like the environment and our history and our land and naturally the anthropocene uh, also a layman who taught english for a living so one part of my talk will actually be about our subject and how that subject has reacted to this thing called the anthropocene now before i go to section 1 there is one more thing i must say much of what i tell you will be about what the scientists have been telling us and here we need to remember that generally speaking scientists are a very cautious lot you know it will be very difficult to find a scientist who will tell you that climate change is responsible for say the fires in california they'll tell you oh it is probably responsible for the fires in california it will be difficult to find a scientist who will tell you that smoking causes cancer they'll tell you smoking probably causes cancer there are little like uh, you know old emperor hirohito of japan when japan had been bombed twice with the atom bomb and was on the verge of surrender he supposed to have said the war has not necessarily turned out to the advantage of the japanese so which is a classic understatement and remember that chap was not just an emperor he was also a scientist a marine biologist and it partly came from the japanese culture that he represented and partly came from the fact that he was a scientist that he was so cautious so scientists are very very cautious they are the opposite of our tv anchors who are always breaking wind i'm sorry breaking news <laughs> all right so that's part of my introduction and the knowledge that we know we know partly because of the work of a lot of physicists and chemists and, and a lot of geologists and so on indeed there are specializations and super specializations and super super specializations inside these uh, and if you gather together the meaning of what they say then you will begin to understand what the anthropocene is but i'll just speak about one thing there to tell you how complex the science is before i proceed see we have very very good information incredible as it might sound about how the weather was not just in say 1800 or 1800 bc but even 500000 years ago now how is that possible it's possible partly because of the work of uh, geologists who examine the rocks and the strata and discover fossils and sometimes even fossilized pollen and dust and analyze them chemically and give us information but much of this has come from a very recent science and this is a science which examines 
I score. That is, ice falls on many parts of the earth. It lies there. Uh, rather, snow falls in many parts of the earth. It lies there. And the next year, more snow falls on it. And this has been happening in some parts of the earth, at least, for millions of years. Now, scientists have lately developed technology whereby they can extract this ice and then examine tiny bubbles of air trapped inside this, examine it chemically, and tell us amazing things about life, say, 500,000 years ago or 700,000 years ago. And much of this knowledge is corroborated by evidence from other sources. So this gives us a wonderful, rich idea about what our past was. Not just our immediate past, our historical past, but what we call deep time or our geological past. All right, that is my introduction. But before I move to the next section, I will tell you that there are two wonderful books I would recommend for this. One is a book by a gentleman called Richard Forty, F-O-R-T-E-Y. It's titled Earth, an Intimate History. It came out in 2005. You can still get copies of it. And the second one is a book I have with me. So take a look. It is titled Origins, How the Earth Made Us. It's written by a gentleman called Louis Dartnell and was published in 2018. I'll mention just one thing from that book so that your interests are aroused. It's not just dry geology in there. Dartnell looks at election results in America and the UK in the 20th and early 21st century. And then he keeps a map showing where, say, the Labour Party or the Conservatives have won and the Democrat, Democrats <coughs> or Labour Party in UK have won. And then he places another map on top of it, a map of the USA for USA and that of the UK for UK elections. And you will notice that it's a striking resemblance between the two maps. The only thing is one map is roughly 2 million years old. What does that map show? That map shows where the earliest deposits of plankton, which eventually resulted in fossil fuels, were in these countries. And the coincidence between those areas and labor supporting uh, waters in England today, and the coincidence between those areas where fossil fuel were deposited, uh, say, one and a half or two million years ago, and where a lot of Trump supporters are active now is amazing. So it is as if events a couple of million years ago were to decide on election results today. So if you want to know more of the details, take a look at Louis Dartnell's book. It's absolutely fascinating and for me, very convincing. I don't know if anybody is prepared such a map about India. Uh, maybe one of you will try. Okay, shall we move on? That's the end of my introduction. And now we start with the second section, which is the Anthropocene. As somebody pointed out, uh, it's uh, something you can Google and find out all these details. Remember, much of the knowledge we get comes from geology and the geosciences. There are many of them. And what these people do is to look at the history of the Earth and divide it into slices. Now, the division is not regular in the sense they don't say, OK, first five million years, we will call it this. Second five million years, we will call it this. Third five million years, this, etc., etc. Nothing like that. They look at the rocks and the strata, and they look for what they call a landmark event or a golden spike that indicates a landmark event. I'll give you a couple of examples, uh, then this will become much clearer. 65 million years ago, an age called the 
Cretaceous age came to an end. We know this age because a famous movie was made called Jurassic Park, which was about dinosaurs. And the dinosaurs reign on Earth, which lasted a few million years, came to an end when this event took place, when the Cretaceous age ended, period ended. How did it end? It ended when a giant meteorite, roughly 10 kilometers across, struck the ocean off the coast of present-day Mexico. Geologists have found out where exactly the meteorite landed, the meteor landed. Uh, they know the crater and have surveyed it and collected soil samples from under the sea. They've also done other amazing things. For example, everywhere on Earth, roughly at 65 million years, the sediments show the presence of iridium and quartz crystals and a lot of soot, all of which are the result of that meteorite strike. So that is an event for which there is evidence in the earth. And unless you have evidence in the earth, a geologist will not give an age a name or suggest that an age is over or that another one is beginning. I'll give you one more example. And that is, we are currently living, not it in the Anthropocene, it's not official. We are currently living in what is called the Holocene. And the Holocene is roughly 11,700 years old. And it began with the retreat of the last ice age. This is also well documented in rocks uh, in many parts of the earth and also in fossils. Which is, not, which is not as well known. For example, there were a number of species that perished, but left records in the fossil at the end of the period before the Holocene. And therefore, we know exactly when the Holocene began. So to cut that story short, geologists look for landmark events, study them very closely, and if they are convinced that life on Earth had changed dramatically, then they attach a label to a particular era. Currently, there's a discussion on whether the Holocene has ended and the Anthropocene has begun. The consensus is that it has, but it is not yet official. Uh, remember, scientists, I told you, are very cautious people. So they have a few more committees which will examine the evidence. There's also a debate about when it began. And only after all of this is settled will the International Union of Geological Sciences take a decision on that. By the way, the International Union of Geological Scientists is an NGO. I'm sorry, in India, the word NGO itself is a four letter word. So we will call it an INGO, International um, NGO. And it is this NGO which has thousands and thousands of geoscientists and geologists as members that will take an ultimate decision on whether we are in the Anthropocene or not. All right, to move to the next section. These people, I'll just refer to them as geologists or the body itself, I will refer using a short form, I'll just say Geologi International Geological Congress. There used to be an organization like that in Charles Darwin's time. So these people have divided, I told you, the past into various slices. And we are, it's a little like a set of Russian dolls. Imagine living inside one of these Russian dolls. Let's suppose the yeah. doll is called the Holocene. If you open the door, you will find that you are living inside another, what do you call it, um, door, and so on and so forth. So we are currently now living in the Phanerozoic Eon, and in Eon is a huge expanse of time. We are also living in the Xenozoic Era, which is a part of the Quaternary Period, which itself 
is a part of the Holocene epoch. And within the Holocene epoch, and please pay attention to this, we are living in the Megalian age. You like that, don't you? There is an age, a geological age, that is actually named after an Indian plates. You know, it's the Megalian age, which began roughly 4,000 200 years ago. Uh, there are three ages in the Holocene. They are the Greenlandian, the North Grippian, and then the Megalian. So we are right now living in the Megalian age, at least official. Now the proposal to change the name will be presented to the relevant committees. And if it is accepted, we will officially be in the Anthropocene, which is the new age of man, all right? Because men, some people argue, have left such a mark in the strata of the earth that it is time we called it the Anthropocene, all right? Now I move to the next section of my talk. And here we will look at the evidence that the Anthropocene is here. I have gathered the evidence under five heads. We will look at them one by one. The first one is this. It is the radioactive layer. In, on June 16, 1945, in New Mexico, a famous scientist called Oppenheimer quoted the Bhagavad Gita. No, he was not out of his mind. He did that because he had actually witnessed the first atomic test. From that day till the end of 1964, a huge number of atomic tests took place. Indeed, between 1960 and 1964, a phenomenal number of atom bombs were tested because both the Soviet Union and the USA had signed a treaty saying that we will no longer test these bombs after 1964. So there's a what geologists call a golden spike in the fossil record. Anywhere on Earth, geologists can find proof for high levels of radioactivity in the form of, uh, I think, um, carbon, some isotope of carbon, or some isotope of cesium and so on. Uh, that is evidence that this took place. And that is evidence that is already there on Earth in the strata under our soil. So the golden spike was in 1964. So some people say, well, let's say 1950 is when the Anthropocene began. Remember the first atomic bomb was in 1945 but five years is fine, let's make it 1950. Remember, India contributed to nuclear pollution, but those tests were not conducted in the atmosphere or above the ground, they were conducted under the ground. There is still some evidence that this was done, but it is not as widespread globally as uh, you know the evidence from the other tests. Okay, the second reason, so that's one reason why we are in the Anthropocene, the radioactive layer in the earth. The second is a exponential increase in what are called greenhouse gases. And here I'll spend a minute talking about carbon dioxide and what is called the Keeling curve. Remember this Keeling curve. Keeling was actually a scientist uh, and he worked for the US government. And in the 1950s, he began measuring the, at, the amount of carbon dioxide in the air. And he came across some very interesting patterns. He found one pattern, which was this, that every day there was a variation in the amount, a variation between the amount found during the day and that found during the night. He then discovered that there was another variation, which was a seasonal form of variation. So he kept records meticulously from then. And after some time, he began to notice 
that there was another pattern to this. With every year, the amount of CO2 in the air was increasing. When he began measuring it in the 1950s, early 1950s, it was roughly 300 parts per million, not 300, a little over 300 parts per million, 350 almost parts per million, right? PPM. Today, day before yesterday, when I checked, uh, it was 418 parts per million. Now, what we need to remember is that for the last 800,000 years, CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere has been between 250 and 280 parts per million. The increase began roughly in 1750, and that's when coal mines in England began to be used to power industries. And therefore, that is clearly a man-made change. All the fossil fuels that we burn, and we burn a huge amount of fossil fuels, are adding more and more carbon to the atmosphere. And some scientists fear that by 2050, we may well cross 700 parts per million. All right? Unless we do something about fossil fuel. And we have no idea what will happen then, although there are some computer models that suggest that extreme weather that we have today might look like a mild thing compared to the extreme weather that so much of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere might bring about. Well, that's one thing. Now, carbon dioxide is not the only greenhouse gas. There's all, there are others, and one of them is methane. Again, for a good part of the last 800,000 years, it's been at around 350 parts per million. Currently, it is 1,800 parts per million. Again, who was responsible for it? Anthropes or human beings. Okay, the next candidate for some change uh, that is brought about by man is what is called the Columbian Exchange. And this Columbian comes from Christopher Columbus. You know, we all know Christopher Columbus and Captain Cook, and some people call him Captain Crook, and Vasco da Gama, and people like this were once considered great explorers. They are indeed great explorers. But they also unleashed a huge number of changes in the world not all of which have been for the good. For example, one of the things that happened after the white man went to the new world is what is called the Columbian Exchange. And what is that? We, you must have heard of Gondwana, you know, the single continent that the earth was once upon a time. Gondwana had split. Now we are talking of events that took place some millions of years ago and the continents were drifting, they are still drifting apart. India is a result uh, of that drifting apart and the colliding of two land masses. So as these continents split, life forms on these land masses developed or evolved differently from those in the parent landmark, which is one of the reasons why we have so much diversity now animals and plants that may have an ancestor in Godwana land today look very different and they have given rise to various other species. So they have all evolved in isolated land masses, sometimes huge land masses like say Africa or Asia or Australia, but the isolation has helped them thrive. Now what happened was, as plants and animals from Latin America or the Americas were brought to Europe and to Asia, and the rivers also took place, a huge number of species which were alien to certain environments began impacting those environments. Uh, I was talking about the drifting apart of the continents and alien species being introduced. So there was this gentleman, Rauf Ali, who said, 
that among wildlife biologists, they refer to this as the IAS, Invasive Alien Species. E.O. Wilson, the famous zoologist, has told us that one out of every 10 species introduced in any land turns out to be deadly to other species. One out of 10 sounds very bad, but you must remember that when thousands of species are introduced, this is virtually playing havoc with biodiversity. So starting with the Colombian exchange, this kind of exchange has resulted in a lot of alien species entering environments where they did not exist and destroying local vegetation or local animal life. We will come to this later when indeed I speak about uh, Kerala. All right. So that's one thing. There's one more interesting thing about the Colombian exchange. Remember when the white man went to the Americas, he did not just take his weapons with him. He took what was probably one of the most powerful weapon anyone has. And that was germs. He took with him the germs of diseases to which he was immune because Europe and Asia had had these diseases for thousands of years. Almost all these diseases uh, were diseases that came to man from the animal kingdom. The chief of them was smallpox. And actually, smallpox was responsible for wiping out something like 95% of the population of native Indians in North and South America. So many people died in such a short span of time that it has actually left its impact on the carbon record. What scientists tell us is that inexplicably, there is a dip in carbon emission roughly in 1610, right? So why is it that there is a sudden dip in, in, in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? Scientists have worked out what happened. What happened was that millions of Americans died from the smallpox or sometimes they were shot dead by Spanish and you know, other invaders and so huge chunks of America that were cultivated by humans suddenly were not cultivated. And in all these places, trees began to grow. So many millions of trees grew that they sucked up so much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere that the actual carbon levels in the atmosphere dipped into 1610. Amazing fact, don't you think? Again, one of the facts for which there is evidence in the geological layers that geologists study. Right now I'm coming to the next set of uh, proofs, shall we say. It is called the Great Acceleration. We are all a part of this Great Acceleration. What is a Great Acceleration? Now, if you look at the world, scientists tell us, you will notice a huge increase in population and production and consumption, roughly from 1750. But that is nothing compared to the speed at which this began to dominate all the things on Earth from about 1950. You name any activity, any material, and you will find that from 1950, production and consumption just shot up incredibly. This is called the Great Acceleration. And the Great Acceleration has succeeded in increasing the standard of living of people in large parts of the earth. But it has also resulted in large parts of the earth being degraded or environmentally destroyed. There is evidence for this again in the records. And so this is one candidate for, what do you call it? Uh, the Anthropocene and people who say that the great acceleration is responsible for the Anthropocene would say, let's make 1950 when the great acceleration is supposed to have begun roughly after the second world war 
as the date for the beginning of the Anthropocene. Along with this is another event, and that is my fifth argument. It's called the sixth extinction. Throughout the history of the Earth, if scientists notice that over 75% of all life forms, not just individuals, but all the species that exist, if over 75% of them die or disappear or go extinct in a relatively short span of time, then it's called a great extinction. Currently, we are experiencing the sixth great extinction. All the five previous great extinctions, like the ones that knocked off the dinosaurs, were caused by natural events, meteor strike, volcanic activity, earthquakes, and so on and so forth. Whereas this is purely man-made. Zoologists tell us that <clears throat> on an average, one species will go extinct every 800 years. That doesn't sound like much. They call this background extinction rate. One species every 800 years. Currently, the rate is several hundred species going extinct every year. Indeed, that's a conservative estimate. There are some scientists who tell us that several thousand species are going extinct every year. Indeed, scientists do not even really know how many are going extinct because in many cases, before the species are documented, they go extinct. All right? That's the kind of problem in which postmodernists should be very interested. Anyway, this extinction is going on. And some people suggest that this is yet another reason why we should call this the Anthropocene. All right. So all these five uh, causes, the radioactive layer, the increase in greenhouse gases, the Columbian exchange, the great acceleration, and the sixth extinction, some of which, of course, uh, sort of overlap each other. All these are anthropogenic or caused by human beings. And therefore, some people will say, let's call this new age the Anthropocene. All right, so that's the end of another part of my talk. And I'm moving to a section that is titled Deep Time. The phrase deep time was actually coined not by a geologist, but by a writer, an English writer, a gentleman called Thomas Carlyle, who once used to be prescribed, and once used to be read, and once used to be slept over, and who is largely forgotten now. We know him because we know that he had a great influence on Gandhi's life. Gandhi was very fond of him as much uh, as fond of him as he was of Thoreau and Tolstoy. Okay, so he's a man who coined the phrase deep time. Deep time is not historical time. One of the problems we have is we very often confuse historical time with geological time. They're totally different. And that confusion can sometimes result in a lot of arguments that are basically absurd. You can hear some of those arguments on television, for example. So deep time is geological time. Uh, it's very difficult to find good writing on it. Actually, there is a little bit of Vedic poetry that refers to deep time. Uh, there is also, I think, deep time mentioned in various creation myths from different parts of the world. Uh, I've read a aboriginal creation myth that appears to refer to deep time. But the man who was most conscious of deep time was Charles Darwin. For Darwin, it was a very, very important feature. And his understanding of how species evolved over deep time is what gave us the theory of evolution. So I want to talk about deep time in a slightly different way. I want to talk about 
how the institution of English or English literature faced up to the time. All right? Um, there are broadly two ways in which we have done it. Or broadly, we have ignored it. We have ignored the Anthropocene. But lately, we have been paying some attention to it. Number one, there's the writer called Amitav Ghosh, and he wrote a book in 2016, which is titled The Great Derangement, Climate Change and the Unthinkable. I want you to think about the title, Great Derangement. What is a derangement? Who is deranged? Somebody who is mad is deranged. And Amitav Ghosh was actually speaking about climate change and the fact that literature had not addressed this particular issue. For him, there was no greater issue in the world. There is nothing more important than the topic of climate change. And he says literature as an institution has totally ignored it. And he called it a form of madness. That's why he titled it The Great Derangement. Uh, this was actually delivered as a lecture at the University of Chicago in 2015. And he came out with a book in 2016. And in it, he said that literature as an institution has failed. Uh, he said it was a failure of the imagination. But he concluded by, by suggesting that literature would correct itself and soon begin to address this. Indeed, if you read novels that have been coming out lately, and other works, you will find that uh, many more writers are now paying attention to uh, the Anthropocene and Deep Time than they were before. I'll mention some of the books after some time. But the second thing is, again, an Indian figures in this. There was Deepesh Chakravarti. Uh, we know Deepesh Chakravarti as a theorist. You know, he was the, shall we say, the general who led subaltern studies almost a Maharaja in the field of literary theory, in the field of post-structuralism and uh, you know, post-modernism. In 2009, he published a paper titled The Climate of History, Four Theses. This came out, uh, like in the case of Amitav Ghosh, thanks to the University of Chicago, it came out in an edition of Critical Inquiry. And in this, he sort of admitted that post-structuralists or the theorists had ignored climate change and the Anthropocene for too long. He's slightly disingenuous in his arguments. Now, he said they were focusing in the 1980s and 1990s on globalization and capitalism and the cultural consequences of this. And maybe that is why they did not pay much attention, that literature did not pay much attention, literature and history did not pay much attention to the Anthropocene. Um, I find that is based on an error. And the error is that well before that time, a lot of good writers were writing about the Anthropocene about nature and about man-made change, it was only that the institution of literature was indifferent to it. Sometimes they were not just indifferent, they were hostile to it. And one of the reasons is that many of these writers were writing about science. And remember, the postmodernists are famous for saying that science is just another narrative as valid as any other narrative. Indeed, if somebody has to be thanked for President Trump and his idea of alternate truth, it is the postmodernist thinkers who are largely supposed to be on the left who have to be thanked for that. Their corrosive form of skepticism had succeeded so much that very little attention was being paid to what the scientists were saying or indeed what the writers who were depending on the scientists were saying. And this is why for over a century, all news of the Anthropocene stayed in small circles. If somebody like Deepesh Chakravarti had read his John Muir, had read his Rachel Carson, 
or read his uh, shall we say ramachandra guha that's good enough then he would have understood that there was a problem and that it was an extremely important problem and maybe then they would have paid some attention to this a uh, couple of years ago um, in 2018 uh dipesh chakravarti was interviewed about his uh, his famous essay um you know the four theses indeed there have been books published on dipesh chakravarti's essay just imagine how important it is uh so he was asked about this and he kind of admitted uh, rather shyly that theory had failed he didn't use the word fail he said the sunset years of literary theory are what uh is what we are going through that's a very interesting phrase you know that the sun has set on literary theory that is a piece of information that neither the ugc nor our english departments have heard please read your deepesh chakravarti next time you want to revise your syllabus all right so uh that is how english literature as an institution faced up to the anthropocene it doesn't make me proud as an english teacher i do i think we should all hang our heads in shame when we think of our role in turning our backs to knowledge and instead indulging in various forms of self indulgence and narcissism in the form of prose that sounds wonderful but means little all right so now i'm moving to my conclusion yes uh, after conclusion there is one more part you know it's not quite the conclusion this is an appeal to my fellow malayalis all right i'll start this appeal by telling you that all the things that i've told you about the anthropocene and how it is affecting life on earth and what the future might be like if there is going to be a future at all uh, there are some scientists who believe that uh, maybe another 1000 years is what human beings have there are some people who think that we might survive for 10000 years uh, which seems overly optimistic jared diamond who wrote the book collapse recently said in an interview that um, he thinks that there is a 49% chance of a total collapse by 2050 2050 remember is a time students when you will all be around uh, so try and see if jared diamond was right now i'm telling you this because here is a book i want you to take a look at if you did not see the title let me just read it out to you don't even think about it why our brains are wired to ignore climate change the author george marshall tells us there is no use talking to people about climate change they will not listen if they listen they will forget it immediately afterwards in other words it will not impact their behavior and he goes into cognitive science and behavioral sciences and authorities like daniel kahneman to tell us why talking about climate change is totally useless because climate change and talk about it depends on logic and logic will never press the right buttons the right buttons will be pressed only if the right emotions are involved and unfortunately climate change does not do that we know that in kerala don't be two years ago we had the great pralayam and uh, everybody was talking about all the things that kerala had to do to make sure that kerala was safe we had to think environmentally but two months later there was only one subject we were discussing and that was whether a stone idol in the uh, western ghats would be inflamed by lust if it actually saw real women we have not gone back even after two more floods to discussing any of the environmental consequences of what we are doing 
to our own state here in Kerala. So each time that happens, I think George Marshall was right. He's right not only about people in America and Europe, but he's also right about us Malayans. So what I would like you to remember is this one thing. If you look at Kerala in history, it was a beautiful and extremely rich place. It was rich in biological sources and resources, nothing else. Uh, it had greater biodiversity than most other parts of the world. And then we changed all that and we are currently changing it due to our models of what we call development. Just consider this one fact. In the late 17th century, a Dutch man by name Van Reed wrote a famous book called Hortus Malabaricus. We know that. He described 792 uh, species of plants which were endemic to Kerala. Right? He was not, in, uh, not talking about plants that were brought here by the Colombian exchange. He got information about this, remember, from a gentleman who came from near Alapi. So you should be a little interested in this, you know, the uh, Ayurvedic physician Itti Vaidyan. And of the 792 species which he described then, a third are now either extinct or they are endangered. We can't blame the white man for this. These are species endemic to Kerala. And if they have disappeared, nobody is responsible for it other than us Malayalis. You know, Malayalis are very proud of themselves. They think that they are hardworking, intelligent, spiritual, whatever that means. They also think of themselves as being Spartan or they used to, um, and so on. But if you look at their recent behavior, you will think that there are another species of Americans or Chinese. We have been so profligate, so self-indulgent, that we are smug consumerists, like the average American or the average Chinese. Uh, so that's a little sad, isn't it? So maybe we Malayalis ought to be reconsidering all these things. Because if there is a tipping point when the climate of the world actually collapses, and some scientists, like I pointed out, think that the tipping point is only 20 or 30 years away, if we have runaway climate change in, say, 2040 or 2050, Kerala will be in very bad shape because there is one condition to which we will be subject extreme temperature plus extreme high humidity, what is called the wet bulb syndrome. That's when your temperature is 40 plus and your humidity is also extremely high. Human beings could just drop dead unless you happen to be in an air conditioned environment. So maybe some Kerala government will think of air conditioning the whole state Right now, they're only thinking of constructing roads across the whole state. Maybe that is a preparation to air conditioning the state. And I would like you all as Malayalis to think about this. Where are we headed? What are the choices we are making? And what sort of a future do we want for our children or grandchildren? Now that actually brings me to the last part of this talk. And here is a small book list. I've mailed a book list to your department. So if any student actually wants it, please contact um, Bindu or study the teacher and they will mail it to you. Uh, it's a book list prepared by an amateur. Remember I told you I'm not a geologist or a scientist. It's largely made up of works in what is called the literature of fact. But if you were to look at many of those works, or all of those works, if you can, it would provide you with a wonderful idea of why the Anthropocene is here and what the Anthropocene is doing to us. 
But I'm going to introduce five or six works now. Um, Rachel Carson and E. F. Schumacher. Schumacher's book, Small is Beautiful, ought to be mentioned in that list. But I'm just mentioning them and passing on. You know, Silent Spring and Small is Beautiful are very, very important when it comes to understanding the Anthropocene. There are a lot of books by Indians, particularly in the last 10 years. I must mention some names. There is a lady called Prerna Singh Bindra. There is Meera Swaminathan. There is Harini Nagendra. There is Gaya Vins. She's not Indian. But all these people have written wonderful books about the Anthropocene. But the books I'm going to mention now are these. Number one, two books by Jared Diamond, the man I mentioned before. The first of those is this, Guns, Germs, and Steel. It is a short history of everybody for the last 13,000 years. Absolutely essential if you have to understand the Anthropocene. The title should remind us of something. Guns, germs, and steel. Those germs are playing a very important role now. We have a webinar because of the germs, right? So you will find how important germs have been in human history if you read this book. There are other books too, but this is a fabulous account of why the Anthropocene is here. There's one more book by this gentleman. And that book has a slightly more threatening title, Collapse. How societies choose to fail and, and or survive, all right? So this is about environmental collapse. He looks at various parts of the world which have either collapsed or are due to collapse very, very soon. And he starts with Montana, which is a state in America where the very rich go to build their second or third homes and to vacation very often. And for Jared Diamond, Montana is ecologically dead. It survives only because it is part of a trillion dollar economy. So try and read Jared Diamond if you can. The next book is a book by a lady called Elizabeth Colbert, K-O-L-B-E-R-T. It's titled, The Sixth Extinction, An Unnatural History. I don't have a copy to show you now, but it's a brilliant and very readable account of the sixth extinction. Now, there are two books I'm particularly excited about, and I'm going to introduce those. Both these are books about deep time. Both these are recent. The first of them is Robert McFarlane. His book is titled Underland, A Deep Time Journey. Absolutely brilliant book. Uh, it's about exploring caves and underground caverns and so on all over the world. And I would recommend it very, very strongly. It is just for the sheer beauty of the writing, worthy of the name literature, not just literature, great literature. And the last of the books I'm going to recommend comes from an English professor. The book is titled Footprints in Search of Future Fossils. It is written by an English professor in Scotland, and his name is David Farrier, once again, beautifully written. There is a section that I read and then immediately reread because it talks about how plastics came into being, about how two or uh, two and a half million years ago, dying photoplankton descended down to the bottom of oceans and so on and how these much, much later were converted to fossil fuels, how in the 17th, 18th, and 19th, and 20th centuries, and 21st century, we have extracted that fossil fuel and lived off it, and how we made this fascinatingly uh, mesmerizing thing called plastic out of it,
and how plastic is now present everywhere on earth from the highest parts of the stratosphere to the deepest ocean can you believe it microplastic is even present inside single cell amoeba in many parts of the earth he talks about that and he talks about how all this plastic will like the phytoplankton of long ago once again perhaps descend to the bottom of the ocean and maybe 2 or 3 million years from now provide more fossil fuel for whoever might want to extract it then it's highly unlikely that there'll be anybody around to extract it and turn it into more plastic but the story of plastic has never been told more beautifully than by david farrier david farrier i told you teaches english literature and he actually takes his students on field trips he doesn't take them to seminars on literary theory he instead takes them on field trips to places of geological interest the book is interesting also because every now and then he moves to literature he cannot but go to his keats or his shelley or carlyle or, or or some other writer to make a point and so we as students of literature i think will find this book fascinating for the style and the substance and i would very very strongly recommend this book too right so that's the end of my list of recommendations and i will now pause and wait for questions if you know the technology permits that now remember almost always my answer will be i don't know but that will be followed by why don't you read such and such a book all right because none of the things i told you came out of my head they've come from various books i was a kind of instrument who took the information in the books and passed it on to you so it is the books in my book list that i would really want to draw your attention to and i hope that if you go to the books you will understand not only what the anthropocene is but understand why it is the most urgent problem facing all of us thank you very much uh, yeah i'm reading the question recently reliance industries chief mukesh ambani made a statement which states that uh, reliance will be a zero carbon emitting company by 2035 many such similar claims have been made by different companies across the world the multilateral nuclear fusion experiment progressing in france is also promising so the question is uh, do all these uh, kind of claims uh, whether these claims are true and whether these claims hold any promise of uh, redemption from all these problems well the answer is the short answer is there are a lot of people who are involved in developing technologies that are carbon neutral there are lots of agencies and individuals and companies that are trying to reverse anthropocene but far too little is being done reliance industries might uh, say that 2035 is when they're going to go carbon neutral china said yesterday that they will be carbon neutral by 2060 well i'm skeptical of both because when companies big corporate especially come out with these statements what we need to remember is that reliance is a fossil fuel company and what is a fossil fuel company doing uh, when they say this except for public relations if they are serious there are a lot of other things that they should be doing to ensure that at least we in india reach a state of being carbon neutral and reliance being so big they would have to take the lead in that uh, i would just imagine that what reliance has said like what the chinese government has said is just part of pr and unfortunately pr does not reduce carbon emissions thank you sir i guess the answer is clear to the uh, students the next question
uh, can the present impact of the pandemic be used as a yardstick for measuring uh, the arrival of the anthropocene no i don't think we can use this pandemic as as a measure it's just one of those things as i told you pandemics have been occurring quite often i think um, lots of students probably don't realize that there was an aids pandemic at one time uh, there have been other pandemics as well and we can't use this as a part of it but in one way what has been pointed out is right because of the large scale destruction of uh, natural resources more and more zoonotic diseases Uh, are making their presence felt that is diseases that spread from animals to man uh in animals you know the coronavirus for instance within bats doesn't create any problems not even mrs bat falls ill but it is when it jumps species that there is a problem and why does it jump species and infect man man is responsible for it so in that sense both this pandemic and a number of others and if you look at the history in the last 50 years itself we have had you know more than 10 i think such cases of diseases jumping from insects to human beings and who knows there might be more in the future um in a sense yes this is something to do with the anthropocene uh before man started doing some of these destructive activities it was highly unlikely for diseases to spread from men to uh human beings indeed there's the argument that <coughs> man <coughs> by starting civilization and agriculture was opening the doors to diseases and pandemics and that men lived fairly healthy and happy lives before settled civilization and farming there's much to be said on both sides but anyway that's the answer thank you sir, thank you, sir. another question what is your yes. opinion on anthropocene narratives do you think they yes. have enlightened us yeah i think they can enlighten us the two books that i mentioned for example are wonderful example of examples of anthropocene narratives if you look at the mcfarlane book there is this terrific description of how ice cores are gathered by scientists and what it means to them and how they get the information out of these ice cores in farrier's book too you have similar things and you have it in many other books so i think these books could open our eyes and move us and the moving our us is more important as i said than opening our eyes because it might actually force us to change our behavior and that is what we need to do change our behavior become more eco friendly okay thank you thank you sir thank you sir uh, another question can we consider climate yes. change as a geological yes. pandemic it is a geological pandemic yes but what we fail to realize is that when we normally talk of pandemics you think of a disease going around the world in a year or two years or three years remember the spanish flu took about three years but remember this is a pandemic that is going to last for a long 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 time see when jared diamond talks about collapse he is thinking of geological time not even historical time it might take 1000 or 5000 years for civilization to collapse and maybe after 5000 years there won't be any homo sapiens left on earth but remember life will still go on our seas will be full not of the fish that are there now but of jellyfish because jellyfish apparently love the acidified and hot oceans that we are creating so collapse will take place but it will kind of take place in slow motion all right or oh, we won't be there to watch it but it will be a lovely movie thank you sir i guess that is clear one question one question yes why why not call the age a capital o c 
Yes, that's a suggestion that many people have made. Uh, indeed, um, you know, Deepesh Chakravarti actually uh, talks about that. He doesn't suggest that it should be renamed capital O C because they think that uh, it is capitalism that is responsible for it. So what I would like to say is that you should look at the Soviet Union and its record in looking after the environment in Russia. If anything, it was much worse than the record of the capitalist world. So the political system really doesn't make a difference. I'm not uh, a capitalist or a lefty in that sense. So the political system doesn't really make a difference. It is whether our decisions, whatever the political system in place, are with the long-term health of the earth in mind. So if that criteria is to be satisfied, we might be able to stave off disaster. If sure. not, it sure. doesn't matter whether we are capitalists or communists or authoritarian or liberal. You know, California is very liberal. Californians have this uh, great boast. The future happens here first. Look at what is happening to California now. <laughs> Most of the state is on fire. There are people who say that California will be unlivable in about 30 years. How does that sound? Sir, there is one more question following the same yes. question. Yes. What about the role of Greta Thunberg and Extinction Rebellion? Oh, I'm a big Greta Thunberg fan. Think of the clarity with which this young girl thinks. And think of her sense of purpose. She's amazing. I think she's done more for publicity about the cause uh, than a lot of other people, people with gray hair. So, Greta Thunberg is wonderful. I hope that she will have followers in India. I've listened to some, within quotation marks, post-colonialists who are not very happy with Greta Thunberg because her skin is fair. Well, I think when it comes to the earth, it doesn't really matter what color your skin is. It is what ideas you're pushing forward. And Greta Thunberg is wonderful, intelligent, motivated. And it is people like her who might save the earth. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, can you take, sir, more, can questions? take more questions? Oh, I can. Uh, yeah. It's a question of whether the students can actually take my answers. Yeah, sure, sir. Sure, sir. I guess many of them are waiting for this. Oh, I have no problems. Sir, can developing countries follow a less energy intensive development path that is followed by industrialized nations. Yeah. That, remember, is the argument that developing countries have been put up, putting up at all the UN forums where climate change is discussed. The argument is very simple. You developed using fossil fuel and creating a warm earth. Now, we should have the right to do that. Indeed, that is the argument that Brazil is using for uh, clearing the Amazon. Politically, it's a good argument. Environmentally, it's not such a good argument. I think that while we try to develop, we should at the same time try to pay a little more attention to more environment-friendly alternatives. Remember, these alternatives are already there. The technology is largely there. It is just that we are so addicted to cheap oil that we do not want to consider the alternatives. And the sad thing is that even third world countries like India, which would benefit enormously by going in for alternative energy, we could turn a little Gandhian in that way. We refuse to do that. Instead, we are as crazy or deranged as... Trump's America. Sir, um, the next question that has come in the chat box. Does yes. the bystander effect explain why at an individual level people are reluctant to change their lifestyles to help the planet? Indeed it does. You know, the George Marshall book that I refer to talks about the bystander effect. But it's not just the bystander effect. There is uh, much more psychology to why we are indifferent to global change or climate change, but the bystander effect indeed is one. Thanks for mentioning that. But, uh, you know, we always think that somebody else will do our job for us. 
take a look at uh, george marshall it's a really fascinating book uh thank you sir we will conclude with just one more question yes you mentioned about the economic expansion that took place after the second world war today yes, we are in a situation yes. yes today we are in a situation which is similar to a third world war do you think there would be a similar economic expansion happening after the pandemic uh i think there is most likely to be a similar Uh, or a continuation not exactly similar a continuation of the great acceleration that was taking place indeed i think that this disease of burning fossil fuel to fuel our expansion that's a problem it's not that we are expanding um, but the fact that we are burning fossil fuels and destroying the earth as we do it i believe that this will spread to africa asia has done its um uh, it's it's part we have destroyed as much of asia as we can remember china has almost no natural forest left india will not have any of it left uh in in in, in a few years from now kerala which was once covered by you know over 60 or 70 percent forest now has on theory some 20 odd percentage it's only theory we will soon replace these with tourist resorts and temples and various other things you know cement and concrete is what we love not trees i i once saw a plastic coconut tree in the yard of a hotel on the mc road and i thought ha ah, this is kerala's future so that's the answer to the question so there is just one question that uh, sounds like uh, the concluding remark that's why i'm putting yes. it to you uh, yes. the question is where should change start well if we wait for change to start elsewhere it's not going to come to us change has to start in a million places because this is not something that individuals can control it actually has to start with governments and these days corporates because corporates are more powerful than governments but these people are very very reluctant to change for example the big tech companies of the world don't care a fig for the environment of course they'll say all kinds of things uh, about the environment but they don't really care they only care about the bottom line which is profit governments don't really care about this because the businessmen who support them don't care for this um, so it has to start everywhere you and i can make minor changes in our lifestyles which will make a difference you and i if you think we are educated people can spread these ideas to other people without offending them all right and maybe slowly we can build up a climate of opinion which is against the current model of economic growth which is suicidal in nature so all of us have a role to play and if we play our roles maybe the governments and the corporates which have a far bigger role to play will also play their role in which case we actually might have a future we can look forward to uh sir thank you um, yes i think uh, i think we can conclude the interactive session actually okay. uh, there are lots of comments coming in to us uh, into the okay. chat box uh, uh, talking yeah. about how the stock has benefited all of them uh, oh, i'm i'm very grateful for that sir would you like to give us some feedback on the interaction in this particular session oh, would you like I, to i like that? the question uh, i like the questions i was able to answer the questions not because i'm full of knowledge but because these are issues that are very relevant and have been raised at some forum or the other and i have read books on all of these things that's all so if you follow the arguments about climate change uh, and the anthropocene you will find that the topics that were introduced by the people who asked the questions are the most important topics concerning this particular area you know about development and our choices and the choices of third world countries and so on and so forth uh, but i still want all of us 
to think about this, particularly in Kerala. I want the Malayali to think about this. Is this what Maveli's land should be like? What kind of a future are we building for ourselves? Do we need the kind of express highways which will cut a journey from Trivandrum to Kasargod by a few hours less at the serious economic and biological and environmental cost that it actually entails? Will we turn all of Kerala into a concrete resort and continue to call it God's own country? Thank you, sir. Uh, the concepts are quite clear to the students, and I think uh, they have they they actually understand why you were called an inspiring and enlightening teacher at the beginning. <laughs> so thank you very much.